briefly, I want to say something about Extinction Rebellion and why it's so great to have Extinction Rebellion and have Robin as part of Activist Graduate School. I think that from my own experience as an activist, now that I'm in my late 30s, approaching my 40s, I see, I've seen environmentalist protests come and go. Yeah, I think we just went through an, a last, the last wave that kind of peaked with the Paris climate marches and stuff like that. And I really see Extinction Rebellion as, as the next wave. And it's really, um, I want to learn from how they're seeing past movements and I want to see how they're going to do things differently. And I, and I, and I want to feel optimistic about um, their success, um, which is our success. So one of the things that has really stood out to me for, from Extinction Rebellion has been their focus on questions of like sovereignty and the constitution and constituent assemblies and, and even in those demands going a lot further than I think the Naomi Klein's and the Bill McKibben's, even though those are very good people. Um, so it's kind of the guiding questions that I want to think about as we're, as we're listening to Robin are questions of history, strategy, and theory. Um, I'm gonna have Robin introduce himself and then I'm gonna play um, a clip from one of the courses, um, the provocation on environmentalism. It's about a minute long. And then we want, and then I'm going to go through and we can talk about the history, the strategy and the theory of extinction rebellion. And then I have questions from, from the, from the audience. Um, and as you're asking questions, just also, you don't have to ask things that you personally believe. You can also ask things that other activists who maybe not aren't here might believe. So just open up a free space. I'm not gonna, you know, if you wanna ask something like completely off the wall, but, but you know that one of your activist friends really believes this thing, please do ask it because they might become a student one day and watch this video and have their question answered. Okay, so thank you for dealing with that introduction. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Robin. Um, yeah, just tell us a little bit about you, um, how you came to activist graduate school, maybe some of your experience as an activist. Please. Sure, great. Well, yeah, I just wanna say, first of all, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Absolute pleasure to have a chat. Um, I guess uh, just introduce myself. Um, yeah, my name is Robin Boardman. I'm 21. Um, I dropped out of university last year to help start a rebellion against the UK government. Um, doesn't mean I don't like a bit of ac activist academia though. Um, and yeah, I've um, been working on this since the start. Basically, I helped sort of co-found the rebellion. It was a, a bit of project of rising up a network, a sort of decentralized network that came beforehand and has taken off in a, in a, in a viral way since. And yeah, we've been sort of cultivating some of that energy through a different kind of story, a different kind of structure as well. Great. Okay. So I'm gonna show... Um, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, and you asked, and so about getting involved with the Activist Graduate Academy, I mean, one of the key things we've been doing is learning from previous movements and learning, you know, looking at the research basically on how this stuff happens and not just, you know, whipping up some theories in, uh, in sort of group circles. So one of the key texts that we looked at uh, was the end of protest. And that was something we studied beforehand and that's how I kind of started to follow some of what you've been doing, Micah. And then and I saw this pop up and I thought that sounds like a good thing to, you know, continue that, that study, continue that research. Cool. What are some of the, before I move, move forward, I'm curious, what are some of the other um, books that, or resources that um, Extinction Rebellion has been kind of drawing on? Yeah, sure. So there's um, a book called This is an Uprising by Paul Engler and Mark Engler, his brother. Um, really fantastic book about momentum driven organizing. Um, there's How Civil Resistance Works by Erica Chenoweth, where you get that 3.5% figure needed to create social change. Um, some of the others include uh, more environmentally related issues like um, Charles Eisenstein, um, the climate and new story, you know, focusing on the biodiversity element to the environmental crisis and not just the, the carbon reductionist element of, of climate. Cool. Okay, so um, I'm going to show a provocation from, this is from the um, course on, uh, the seminar on theurgism. Um, let's see, and this is about, it's a minute long and it's about um, environmentalism. So hold on one second, let me share my screen. Let's see. There we go. Okay, can we see it? Here yeah. we go. Okay. <laughs> I'll tell you what I honestly think. 
I believe that the leadership of the environmentalist movement is to blame for the failure of environmental protest and probably as guilty for climate change as the polluters themselves. I'm sorry for your generation, but we will never stop climate change. That time is over, and the reason why it's over is Bill McKibben, Naomi Klein, 350.org, and those organizations who use tactics that they knew were going to fail. The idea of doing climate marches, come on, we had just had Occupy Wall Street. Like, seriously. So, and we can't just blame the opposition and say it was Shell, Exxon, and these people. It's like, no. At a certain point, what about our leadership? They were the ones who told us what to do, but now the environmental movement is over. We will never stop climate change. Mm. Okay, that's, that's the provocation. <laughs> and I think that in many ways why Extinction Rebellion is exciting is because it's coming out of um, after that moment. Yeah, of, out of that know, frustration. Yeah, out of yeah. that frustration. So... All right, let's get into it. So that's, that's kind of framing remarks. Um, so I'm curious, first, let's start with history. Let's talk about Extinction Rebellion. Let's talk about your relationship to prior environmentalist movements and, and how you're doing things differently. Just basically the history of where you're going, the history of where you came, where you came from and where you're headed. Sure, yeah. So I kind of want to just start off with, you know, the sense that I feel and a sense that a lot of people feel in Extinction Rebellion is this unprecedented sense of emergency about what's happening, the collapse. And, and I'm not really gonna talk about that that much in what we're talking about, because I'm assuming that most people here will know about it, but it's the severity of it that's really sort of sparks a lot of the energy and the, the willingness behind what we're doing. Um, so I think, yeah, to follow on to so the story, it really comes from rising up, um, sort of a decentralized network in the UK that, that looked at, um, what it called the three pillars of a toxic system. That was the toxic finance system, uh, the toxic media, you know, billionaire media, um, and the lack of democracy uh, in the UK. And those, and that was a network that kind of was quite spread out across the UK and different groups of it focused on different elements of those pillars. Um, and it, the, the beauty of being decentralized was that you could create tactics or or strategies that could be easily shared and done throughout the UK, but the, the difficulty was bringing together a kind of cohesion. So in a paper um, that Roger wrote last year, Roger Hallam, he, uh, he wrote a paper about why um, climate change now demands a rebellion against the UK government and why it's got to this, the point where um, the UK government no, now lacks legitimacy um, you know, the social contract between the people and government has been broken because they are no longer protecting um, its citizens. And this is something you can see across the political spectrum, right? You know, whether it's your kind of radical type person, and you think, okay, egalitarianism, that's obvious, then we need to be doing something about it. Whether you're a more liberal person and you're thinking, well, it's about, you know, individual rights. Well, John Locke is all about, you know, if the government fails to protect those, those rights of, of individuality, then you need to rebel. On even the cons more conservative levels of looking at, well, you know, what's the most important thing? Well, it's order and security. How the hell can you go, uh, guarantee order and security in a society that's falling apart? So from that, from that basis, we sort of say, well, this current government is no longer legitimate and there needs to be uh, a rebellion um, to change that in a serious way. Uh, and that's where the Extinction Rebellion really came from. And from the beginning, it's really framed itself as being, you know, that the, go the government is no longer legitimate. And therefore, civil disobedience is the thing that's needed to change it because that's what the, the research shows, right? That's what Erica Chenoweth's research shows. That's what when you look at, um, you know, the big uh, civil resistance movements of the past or the Freedom Riders, the Children's March, you know, Martin Luther King uh, or the Gandhian movement or Otpor in Serbia. These are the kind of things that create that change. And as Micah mentioned in the sort of the provocation, however, it's not the marches, all right? The marches are done. And in the UK, we particularly felt that with the Iraq, uh, the Iraq war march all across the world, obviously in 2003, a million people out in the streets that did nothing. And just recently, a couple of, um, you know, last a couple of weekends ago in the UK, we had a million people out on the streets uh, demanding a second vote on the referendum around Brexit and 6 million people signing a petition saying they wanted to change it. And it's just fallen on complete deaf ears. 
So it just shows really that the need for civil disobedience is so, um, yeah, so important now. And I guess the way it spread across the UK was by a simple, I guess it's more like an old school uh, organizing method, which is just going around into town halls, city and council halls, and giving talks about the climate crisis and the need for rebellion, the history uh, and, and the social change research uh, and how that can create a difference. And then really, I guess, the rebellion became something quite different once it entered a bit of a whirlwind type moment, as Paul Engler might call it, where um, George Monbiot, a prominent Guardian columnist in the UK, started writing an article about Extinction Rebellion and then Bernie Sanders shared it on Facebook and then we went into this massive growth period. So when we were initially planning about declaring the rebellion um, in, in, in London, in Parliament Square, it was mainly this idea of, you know, it doesn't matter if there's 10 of us or if there's 50 because we know in our hearts that this is the right thing to do. And that's a, as a key value that a lot of us hold is this idea that's probably similar to something like virtue ethics rather than utilitarianism, which is that we do things because we believe they're right rather than because we think they're going to get this big fancy result. So there are you know, sort of 50 of us planning to be in that uh, Parliament Square area. And then because of the, the more whirlwind type moment, there were a thousand people there blocking the road outside Parliament which was, yeah, amazing. And so from that rebellion, we kind of grew into something larger. The fol you know, following couple of weeks, we shut down five of the bridges uh, in London um, in a really peaceful day of mass civil disobedience. Um, you know, not seen for quite some time in the UK actually breaking the law in that way and not just you know, going on the usual march and have since been um, using movement building, I guess, to get to the point of international rebellion. So things like, you know, activists um, throwing blood, fake blood all over Downing Street in a kind of challenging that, we, you know, this government, we all have blood on our hands um, for not challenging the environmental uh, crisis. And, uh, you know, the naked protests, which you probably saw earlier in the week, which have gone sort of viral and got even MPs talking about, um, you know, what's happening and the extent of it. So these are some of the different yeah, tactics that are being used. And I think a key element to particularly the naked protest on Monday was the, the decentralization is still a core value in what Extinction Rebellion does. And that wasn't a sort of you know, centrally planned thing. In fact, most people when Extinction Rebellion had no idea it was gonna happen. It was a small affinity group from outside London that said, actually, let's do this. This is a great idea. And they just went and did it. <laughs> and then you're like, wow, okay. So that's the thing that kind of take that real energy forward is these decentralized networks. Yeah. So let's talk about, I mean, I think one of the things that's really interesting in what you're saying is that um, you, yeah, that the Extinction Rebellion really situated questions of political legitimacy at the origin of its founding. So that, you know, the reason why, like you laid it out, the reason why we need a, a rebellion is because our governments are, are not legitimate, et cetera. But what, like, I guess what I'm curious about is to what degree is Extinction Rebellion actually willing to then govern and like how much of a rebellion still falls into the paradigm of like um challenging the existing structures but not replacing them like hmm. and i i mean i guess one one part of this is you have this and this gets into the question of strategy but you have this um idea of setting up like a a, a citizens assembly and yeah. so like but what i'm saying is at what point does a rebellion just fizzle and what are what are the ways in which thinking about how to, how do we like turn a rebellion into like establishing a new form of legitimate government or something like that. Sure. Those, yeah. yeah, so I think my, I mean, I guess another thing about Extinction Rebellions is like my personal interpretation yeah. of the way that it's going. But our current three demands are really, they're, they're got the demands to the government itself, right? So they're in, in, you know, requiring its own response. And one of them is the creation of a citizens assembly, which would guide the decisions of the government. And it would create this this paradigm, which maybe you could compare to um, uh, like participatory budgeting in Brazil, you know, in Porto Alegre, where they have mass a number of people that decide how parts of the budget is going to be spent, and then the council approves that budgeting. And they've never not approved it because they know if they didn't, the people would be in uproar about it. So it's a similar idea with the Citizens' Assembly, right? It's giving this democratic um, alternative, which is definitely going to be more fair, you know, seeing examples of it in Ireland and other places, and saying, you know, this, they must follow this system if they set it up, which would be a huge win, you know, and a, a key part about what we're doing is kind of prototyping the, 
the need for regime change or rebellion in Western democracies and how this is how we can do it and then trying to prototype that for other places because, you know, the UK is, you know, cool and everything, but it's not where the real change is going to happen. In fact, I'm kind of hoping you folks over in the States will do that for us because that's, you know, where the, you know, where the change really needs to spread. Um, but anyway, yeah, so the Citizens Assembly kind of puts that, puts that forward as, as the new form of democracy. And the idea being that if these three demands aren't met by the government, then you've tried what you can do to reform that existing system. And then if that fails, then, you know, the three demands will change and become, you know, the, the government needs to be changed and the Citizens Assembly needs to be the thing in power. Cool. So let's talk about um, the strategy. I'm curious. So what's cool in this, um, I went onto the website, who we are, principles and values. Number uh, two, mm. it says, we set out our mission on what is necessary. And, the, and what that is, is mobilizing 3.5% of the population to achieve system change using ideas such as momentum driven organizing to achieve this. So this is very interesting to me because I love when activists try to quantify exactly what is necessary, you know, so that, so you've quantified it. It's 3.5% of the population. And you said earlier that this is from Erica Chenoweth, but can you, can you break that down? Why 3.5% of the population? So that's what, um, from the research, we've sort of seen that's, you know, even in the most you know, totalitarian states or whatever, with anti, um, for, for regime change, you need that 3.5%. Although, you know, that 3.5% is mainly in those totalitarian regimes. It's not as well documented for, you know, in Western democracies. So that's something where we're kind of experimenting. I think a lot about what Extinction Rebellion is doing is experimenting with different forms of protest, like, you know, you talked about, you know, the NGOs or whatever, you know, Bill McKibben, all this kind of stuff in, in the introduction. And I think that that's something we, we looked at from the start is saying, you know, for 30 years, NGOs have basically failed to do anything serious about what they've known for a long time to be a serious threat. And that's why we did things like Occupy Greenpeace and challenge those, those institutions or, you know, oh, I'll be occupied and blockaded the BBC, you know, the state media in the UK. People go, well, you know, surely it's the Daily Mail, sure it's the more far right wing media. And we go, no, no, no. These are the guys that have the responsibility to tell the truth about what's happening. And that's a key message there, is just tell the truth and act accordingly to that. So tell so, us more. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, so yeah, the 3.5% is really, it's something that's quite powerful. Uh, in these kind of public meetings, you can say to people, look, you know, we need 2 million people in the UK, but also we frame that in, you know, that's 2 million people kind of actively participating, you know, what Erica describes, or this is kind of like, you know, going along to meetings or doing flyers or whatever, but there's an introduction, we, you know, kind of introduce something different to that, which is that there's a kind of power law involved. And this is a kind of, you know, bit of our own research, but the, the, the higher the level of the sacrifice that you do as part of those actions, the bigger effect it's going to have. So maybe it's 2 million people out on the streets like it was in you know, Egypt or whatever during the Arab Spring. Or maybe it's you know, 20,000 people getting arrested. Or maybe it's 1,000 of them going to prison. That's the, and, and then when you say that, you're like, okay, it's 1,000 people going to prison that could cause this system change, you know, like with the Freedom Riders in, in, the, in the States. Then suddenly you're looking around at a public meeting of you know, 100 people and saying, well, that's 10 of us. And then you just do this, you know, a hundred more times and then we've got everyone we need. <laughs> and yeah. that kind of energy was tan you know, tangible at the end of those meetings of going, we could do this. Yeah, it does feel like, I mean, two things that occur to me. One is like that it does feel like kind of a shift away from, you know, with Occupy famously, the whole rhetoric was we are the 99 percent. And, and I think the social movements of 2011 going up until, you know, whatever, 2017, 18 or whatever, really tried to emphasize this idea that we are the majority. And that, and that we are legitimate because we are the majority. You think about the anti-war marches. Like, we're, we're, you know, we're so many people, you can't resist us. And I do like this, or I do find this interesting, this turn towards, well, maybe we're not the majority. Maybe instead, actually, all it takes is 3.5% of the population, which is not enough to win any election in the world, but could be yeah. enough to shift our societies in a new direction. Absolutely. And just on that point, I want to kind of bring in some own critiques of XR, just to make you guys in the States aren't familiar with them as we are here, you know, dealing with the radical left or whatever. But so one of them is about, okay, so why isn't uh, Extinction Rebellion more diverse? Why is it all white middle class people, right? And I think that there's an element around that, which is looking at that 3.5% and saying, you know, mass participation, getting the, the people involved. Well, you want to go for the lowest hanging fruit. 
to make that happen, right? You want to go for the people that are going to make it into that. And so we do, you know, grow in that way, but we use models from the global south and obviously have massive, you know, uh, focus around diversity and intersectionality. But we're saying, you know, look, if this is the 3.5% of people we need and we can get them through these actions that we're doing, then let's get them involved, right? Let's bring on Middle England or whatever into these actions. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's challenging though, because I could see... Yeah, I don't know. It's, 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 it is an interesting question of saying, well, if we only need 3.5%, but which 3.5%? Yeah. You're right. And if it's, is, it the, is it the ones who seem to be already the closest to this position? Or is it, um, like, in some ways, maybe you need 3.5% of the people who, you know, using your paradigm, you mentioned earlier about power, uh, power law, but, like, maybe you need 3.5% of progressives, but if you had only 1% of, like, conservative Christians or another demographic that was not usually part of these, you know, or 1% of the African-American population or whatever. But, um, yeah. so, okay. So, um, I promise people that we would make, we wouldn't stay too long. So let's, let's move forward now to this question of the theory. So we've already been touching about this a lot. So what would you say is extinction rebellions kind of theory of change and how does it differ from maybe other environmentalist movements that have happened? I know, We've kind of been talking about this, so I'm curious if you could bring it out more. Yeah, sure. So I think it is, um, yeah, it's, it is largely around this this focus on sort of expedience. Maybe um, an interesting dynamic to add into it is this idea of um, love or respect, right? It's a huge part about what we're doing, you know, the non-violence, the, the love, the, the element that it's not, you know, you look at Gene Sharp stuff or whatever, and it's all about, okay, so there are these two big things you need to do. Um, you need to disrupt uh, what's happening and you need to make a sacrifice, you know, you need to get arrested or whatever. And that makes the big social change. Well, we're kind of adding in this third dynamic, which is about respect and loving each other. And even that also means the police or whatever. So it means respecting the police. That If you're out on a protest, you don't say, you know, fuck the police or whatever. You treat them with respect and you say, okay, I understand what you're doing. You're doing your job, you know. If you need to arrest me, you arrest me or whatever. And, uh, and building that relationship because, you know, we know, you know, from the more psychological research, which has been mainly done by, you know, uh, businessmen or whatever, salespeople around how to get people to concede in negotiations or whatever, is, you know, the biggest factor that this big Harvard study found was just simply liking the person. If you like the person, then they're more likely to give those concessions, right? So that's another part we're kind of bringing in is this idea of, yeah, the social change comes through disruption you know, with the International Rebellion starting in a couple of weeks' time, that is a heavy focus on disruption. It's a heavy focus on shutting down London in multiple places. Um, it's also about the sacrifice. You know, people are willing to go to prison, uh, and that has an effect. People in their socioeconomic group, you know, you see someone that looks kind of like you, they're going to go to prison. You're thinking, maybe I could do that as well, or maybe I could go out on the streets because that person's kind of like me, and they've done something really important about something that I kind of care about. So maybe I should do something. And it's those kind of psychological trends that, you know, help to build this, this wider movement. I think looking at, yeah, how, how the, the sacrifice and disruption really is the core of about how, you know, we, we get the government to the table uh, is key. And then I think that what, you know, we think about more about um, after the international rebellion, after this huge period of disruption is, is more about, you know, how do we create the, the structures that uh, can, you know, either create some kind of dual power type system or even look to, you know, challenge and, and take it over um, if they don't, you know, meet the demands. So I have one last question and then I want to open it up to questions from the other people who are on the call. But I guess the last thing is, um, I'm curious about, you mentioned in passing this, I, this Occupy Greenpeace. So one of my like pet things I've been trying and thinking about, so I'll be so awesome is if we could get an environmental protest against the old environmentalist organizations. At the same yeah. time as we're protesting Shell, on the same day of action, we're also like being up to 350 and being like, yo, 350.org, like you, you killed us. Like, I'm sorry, yeah. you killed us. Between the 70s and, you know, whatever. So I'm curious about Occupy Greenpeace and what was, the, tell me about that. What was the response within that movement to that kind of behavior? Yeah, so it was a great sort of uh, example of polarizing, which is a really powerful technique, you know, is to start polarizing people um, around the movement and not the issue itself. Um, but yeah, so what we did was the Occupy Greenpeace, we went in with drums and we read out the declaration of rebellion and we gave everyone in the offices flowers 
and we said, you know, we're here in Peaceful, you know, we love Greenpeace, we love the fact you've been doing stuff, but, you know, you know we, that means you need to up your game, you need to understand what's really happening. And, you know, they kind of gave their kind of, you know, nice guy routine on us, like, oh, thank you very much, you know, respected whoever, but could you please leave now? <laughs> and so we've been having these meetings with Greenpeace for quite a while, actually, to kind of get them to actually endorse some real civil disobedience. Um, and it's been quite a tricky road, quite bumpy. You know, we said so we'd do a hunger strike against them quite recently if they didn't um, start supporting. And since then they have. They've given quite a bit of money to the rebellion and, you know, started putting some energy towards that. So it's creating a real dilemma situation, not just for people in power, but for the people who are allowing this to continue. Uh, you know, it's a big, what's that, you know, Martin Luther King quote about it. It's not the you know, the conservative white uh, KKK guys that are holding us back. It's these liberal white guys that are just sitting around letting it happen. And that's, you know, the liberal elite is a key target of the people we want to try and, you know, win over. Cool. All right, great. So um, if anyone has a question, feel free to, to jump in. And I have a bunch of questions, but we also we have about, if we extend, we can go about another 10, 15 minutes. I'm um, happy to extend. I thought it was going to be an hour. So. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? Um, yeah, I, I have a question about the numbers here. Um, so we've got like 65 million people in the UK and 3.5% is like 2.275,000. Um, so like that, those thousand people who are going out and getting involved in direct action, I can see that there's a compelling reason for them to get involved, that they get like, fired up around the direct action and everything. But I think it's also possible to have a thousand people and not, and perhaps not reach that much wider and not reach the other like two and a half million that you need to get to. And I was wondering what that compelling offer is to the other two and a half million to actually get mm. involved. That it's not, um, that it's not just sort of like, doing leaflets or something which is a little bit boring but you know that gives them something that they can get excited about and get involved in sure uh, that's a very good question so i think in terms of how we you know reach different elements of society that's not just you know oh the protesters doing their thing so one of the things we've been looking at recently is cultural institutions how can we get cultural institutions to declare themselves um, in a state of climate emergency and what does that mean for you know the tate uh, britain or uh, the Globe Theatre, you know, Shakespeare's regional theatre, to say, we're going to go and declare a climate emergency. And that, again, reaches to kind of different audiences. And the more sort of decentralised we become and the more you know, areas that people look at, the, the more people we're kind of reaching in that 2.5 million. And I think the a real power has been in our, in our local groups. We've got about 120 local groups, I think, in the UK. And one of the, the, the structure, basically, of a lot of those is to do the kind of Occupy People's Assembly and to have everyone break into small groups and organize, you know, as autonomous working groups, what they want to do in their local area. So, you know, if you're like, you know, Bill and you're like in that 2.5 million and your big thing is about, you know, veganism or whatever, and you want to go do an action at the, the supermarket, you're thinking, well, I uh, I don't know if I could ever do that. And then you go along to one of these meetings, meet a bunch of people who are, you know, up for doing such shit about it. And you get into that group of people, you say, okay, let's go off and do it. And that's the empowering thing that's really brought more and more people into this is saying, you know, you know, I have ownership over what I can do. I agree to all the principles and values, you know, like my convention, you sit in that, our mission is what is necessary. We're nonviolent. We, you know, appreciate a regenerative culture of looking after each other and ourselves. Um, so yeah, we agree to all those principles. So now it's to go out and do something about it. Thanks. I guess I'm I'm curious about I'm still I'm still kind of curious about this whole this question of like rebellion versus revolution and what does I mean I'm trying to think about other movements that have oriented themselves around this word rebellion and I'm I'm just curious more say more about what what does rebellion mean. Um, to the movement and how does that differ from saying like extinction revolution mm. yeah well i guess one of the things that we were looking at um when we first started thinking about the name and the messaging is we didn't want to sound too left-wing so the word revolution has strong you know left-wing connotations and uh, in a place like the uk you know which where we hasn't seen a revolution for 400 years or whatever you're looking at a quite a you know 
a, a, a hard rock to push, if you know what I mean. So, um, yeah, the word rebellion is much more sort of culturally accepted here. You know, MPs go in rebellion against the, the parliament, all this kind of thing. It's a much more, yeah, kind of uh, accepted word, but it's also more, you know, it's also about that kind of like, we want this big system change reform. And if you're not going to give it to us, then we have to, you know, escalate. And I think kind of Gandhian escalation tactics are a big part about what we're doing as well with this international rebellion um, week or, you know, or ha- for however as long it takes is, you know, we block the roads on the first day and then we start to block the, the tubes on the second, the trains on the third. You know what I mean? It's not like we're just going to sit there and say that we're blocking the roads, you know, but we're going to grow from that and say this is an escalating thing. And the rhetoric, I believe, will escalate that with that, if you know what I mean. So, you know, if you don't meet our three reasonable demands to the government, then, you know, then the government needs to be changed. I have so many questions, but I don't want to keep, if anyone else wants to jump in, go ahead. Um, I have, so I have like a half formed question. Um, So it's actually about like the danger of being co-opted. Um, and the danger of um, actually a lot of what you want to achieve being achievable within existing systems. So, for example, the example that you gave of the vegan activists who want to go and lobby supermarkets. A lot of supermarkets are getting on the game now in providing a lot of like vegan options. They're really extending their ranges. Um, you know, it's possible to to eat a vegan diet quite easily now. Where yeah, uh, uh, how do you guard against sort of, how, how do you sort of like maintain the rag- radicalism of your demands and make sure that they're fully met when it's quite easy for a lot of organizations like that to maybe meet them sort of like 75, 80% of the way and sort of take all of the energy out of, out of you like that? Like, how do you measure that, um, monitor it, guard against it? Yeah, yeah. how do you think about it? Yeah, so I guess one of the biggest kind of worries we had about sort of co-option when we first got started with this was this kind of Trotskyist element that exists in the UK, which kind of tried to take over momentum. It's called, you know, the Socialist Workers Party, this kind of thing, which is, you know, really, you know, quite well known for kind of getting into meetings and trying to, you know, sway them all towards this kind of, you know, it's the workers' revolution type way. So we had that as in mind, but really what we found has been more difficult is the kind of liberalising uh, co-option it's like you know you get all these groups that form all across the UK and they don't have this same radical base you know they don't all say you know we're in rebell- rebellion we're going to use some disobedience they might say oh I just care about climate and I think we should get together and talk about you know and maybe we should you know, send some letters to MPs and stuff and we're just like you know that's done you know we're not doing that anymore and so I guess yeah keeping up the sense of radicalism has been has been has been a harder a task actually so you know one of the talks we had with Paul uh, Engler was about you know communicating our dna communicating our story our strategy and our structure and running trainings on that to remind people about you know where the essence of what we're coming from is and train them you know continuously on you know what the strategy is and how it works or why civil disobedience is necessary why a story which requires people to you know make a sacrifice and get out into the streets of london where you know the uh, politicians and the media are based and do civil disobedience is necessary and not, you know, just the usual marches or whatever. And I think, um, yeah, another part we've been trying to, it's been trying to like back and forth with the whole liberalizing thing has been these student strikes, which are obviously, you know, powerful, right. And, you know, great that so many young people are getting involved with stuff, but at the same time, you know, got this like slightly nervous, uh, twinge about it which is like it's the same as the, all these things we've seen since 2011 these big social movements that kind of grow out of social media quite rapidly but don't have a coherent structure or you know a real way of you know uh, demanding that change and then will fizzle out again quite quickly afterwards and it's not you know yeah we just need to, we've got a structure in extinction rebellion that's pretty was pretty tight and we've got these, you know, this demand for a new form of democracy. We're not saying that we're going to govern the, the country or anything. We're saying the people are going to govern the country. I'm curious about, so why do you think that, and this is really interesting, this idea of um, co-optation and that the, that the danger of co-optation could actually be from, I mean, people who are sympathetic, but literally like the people who are sympathetic are, are kind of a danger because they're removing this edge. That's a very good and interesting point. What, but 
I guess two questions is, and this kind of jives with what Allison was saying, but can the demands of Extinction Rebellion be achieved within the current system? Mm. And if, and also I'm, I'm, I'm curious about like, is, um, can Extinction Rebellion only be successful if it is radical? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I find it um, very difficult to imagine that in the current system we could really meet um, our demands, to be honest. I think a big part about what we're doing is um, shifting the Overton window. You know, this, uh, this idea that he's in political science, you know, the things that are currently talked about. So the things that are currently talked about when you talk about climate change are, you know, the Paris agreements and staying under two degrees C. But by using this kind of more radical flank, you know, civil disobedience, talking about it in, this, in a much more powerful way, we're starting to actually move the frame over to what's really happening, which is societal collapse and looking at the threat of, you know, hundreds of species going extinct every day and even the potential threat of human extinction. And this is a really, you know, core part about how we're all feeling and why you know we get quite emotional in, in what we're doing and we're you know not just challenging uh you're not just being you know radical in our you know disruption of the streets but also you know when we talk to the media or whatever and we're trying you know we're trying this routine of not just saying you know i want to sit here and do my whole ngo routine of giving you a few stats and saying you know, how it is and then sort of walk up again afterwards but you know starting to cry or scream on tv and saying this is it you know this is the moment and that's what's going to, you know, get uh, Mark, who's doing his ironing, to actually listen on the radio, or whatever. Is not just this sort of the same, you know, liberal message. Um, so I think that radicalism is super important. I think, and, and by radicalism, it's basically experimentation with new stuff, right? It's experimenting with different ways of protesting. Experimenting with, you know, like we're talking to um, momentum at the moment in in the UK. You know, this big, you know. Um, mobilizing force it's mobilized a lot of left-wing people and saying you know why aren't you doing something about this why aren't you getting involved with civil disobedience and encouraging your base to do so because it's totally necessary so shifting that over to window over to something that's more uh i would call realistic given our, our current situation um do you feel like sometimes that the climate catastrophe has actually already happened and that it was like, sometimes I think that we were expecting it to be like a big boom, but actually it was just like something that happened in, you know, whatever, 2015. We don't even really remember the tipping point, but it's already over. Does, does Extinction Rebellion come from a perspective, like do you come from a perspective of this is something that we can stop? Or is it a perspective of like, this is something that we can mitigate? Or is it something like, you know, like where, where are you? Cause I think a lot yeah, of yeah, them, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, you know, again, the personal orientation, but I know a lot of people who are caught to this movement and it's not about stopping uh, climate change. It's totally accepting that where we're at is, is fucked and that, you know, we're not going to have the Arctic that much longer. And that basically in this time of collapse, it's our duty to do what is right and what is necessary to try and protect as many people as possible. And we know that millions of people are going to die and uh, unless we do something about it and probably will die already given the circumstances you know i was gonna before i decided to drop out of university i was going to go for a year abroad um to mozambique um to do conservation work and working and, and, and practicing portuguese uh, and the city i was going to go to is called baira it's on the coast and a couple of weeks ago that city was hit by a cyclone called Adai, which destroyed 90 percent of the whole place killed over a thousand people and the activists there, when you speak to them, they say, you know, this isn't, you know, Mozambique. This is what the Western world has done to Mozambique. And that's crushing, basically. But that is the, the reality we're now looking at. And it's about doing everything we can to, you know, to stop mass starvation, basically, and other, you know, serious uh, crises hitting this planet. And doing that from a place of, you know, love, basically, like I said earlier, and trying to build resilient communities, ones that where people do have a say on what's happening and, you know, can organize in their own street to, you know, create more regenerative agriculture, this kind of thing. Do you see, I mean, that's a really powerful, so this is one thing I kind of talk about in my book is that's that, that's a really powerful place to be arguing from that collapse millions of people dying and very apocalyptic. Do you see that 
it's also kind of, I think it can be appealing to like tyrannical or totalitarian like forces. So do you see people, how, how, who's been drawn to Extinction Rebellion? Do you see people who are also right wing or like tending towards totalitarianism kind of interested? To yeah, uh, that's interesting. Actually, we do have some more conservative voters who join and, you know, it's interesting you ask them, you know, these grandparents, whatever they might come from the sort of rural suburbs of, of the UK and kind of say, well, what, why are you getting involved? And they say, well, it's about my grandchildren first and foremost, but it's also about, you know, that they're scared about migrants coming into the country. And that's what climate change is going to do, right? It's going to bring in a lot of migrants to, to the UK and they're scared about that. And that's interesting, right? Because, yeah, that's why people, different people are getting involved for different reasons. And we're saying the Citizens' Assembly will decide on the policies that happen. So the people decide. And we're not saying any, you know, we're not advocating any policies. We're not saying, you know, go Green New Deal or build a wall or whatever. We're saying, you know, the people decide through, you know, informed decisions made by sortition. You know, so people that actually represent the UK uh, and not just, you know, the sort of self-selected um, people. Um, so I think that part of it has been, yeah, really important. And then thinking about, you know, how to mitigate the eco-fascism, basically, is what we kind of call it, uh, is through this, um, you know, the focus on the democratic methods and also uh, the framing of the Citizens' Assembly being around, you know, how do we become carbon and resource neutral by 2025? in a just way and that just way is all about you know uh you know protecting people of the global south etc mm. but i think yeah i think just in terms of framing like i said from earlier you know we didn't want to use left-wing type language we tried to you know come from this place of you know this is a british thing to do is, is to rebel you know p appealing to that sort of nature a little bit and also to be like we're not on the political spectrum we're just coming at this because it's the right thing to do um, yeah, that's been quite a powerful message for a lot of people. Moving beyond party politics, what we call it. Hmm. Okay, I, I have another question now, from, based on what you just said. I, I wonder if you had like a deeper or sort of more detailed statement of, of ethics for the Extension Rebellion that you asked people to subscribe to. And I wondered how far you feel that you need to in order to um, preserve the aims of the movement and to sort of like really, um, yeah, to sort of like, um, so what, what, what sort of like troubled me, I guess, is just, I, I actually work on migration. And so the idea that um, it's possible to, to just tackle climate change without thinking about those sorts of bigger issues around how mm. we police orders, how, why we have them in the first place, why we try and restrict um, the movement of people. Um, it's, it's quite problematic to, to, be, to, to not actually be having those discussions alongside this sort of discussion around climate and things. And to, like, it is possible to imagine a world where, um, which has sort of like heavily fortified borders and is really like keep people out, keep um, close the borders and which is, um, you know, reducing carbon and, and um, preserving at least some um, of the environment and everything. And I just wondered like, you know, at, at what point does that mix of politics become a problem in, in achieving these longer term goals? And in sort of, at what point do, those right-wing politics start to become a problem which um, undermine the, the core of what, of what you want to achieve. Yeah, well, I mean, we can see it now, right? You know, we see these um, sort of fairly rich Silicon Valley type people building bunkers and that kind of thing to protect themselves against, you know, the crisis or whatever they're calling it and, and you know, and, and using that that method. And I think we you know, see that from the sort of the wealthy elite as we continue, you know, if, if things continue as the way they are. Um, so I guess, you know, a lot of it comes back to the, the Citizens' Assembly and looking at how ordinary people are going to vote on these issues of, you know, are ordinary people going to vote uh, in a way um, in which, you know, people are going to start building walls or they're going to start to talk about building eco-villages. Um, and that's the beautiful thing about democracy is everyone, you know, uh, it's the kind of, you know, everyone thinks that their way is going to be the one that goes through, right? 
um, I guess what we've seen from uh, previous citizens' assemblies is a big shift towards progressive values. You know, they had a citizens' assembly in Belgium about um, immigration and climate change. And, you know, there was this sort of 40% of people who thought that, you know, immigration was a dangerous thing um, and that they brought, you know, crime into the country and about 50% of people who thought that climate change wasn't so much of an issue. And they both sort of swung 10% towards the more progressive value by the end of the Citizens' Assembly. So it's through this, you know, through seeing experts talk about issues, but also being able to talk with others about what's happening, that you see a big more, you know, more of a switch, shift towards progressivism. Um, so yeah, so I think that kind of thing would have a big impact on the kind of policies that people would go for, you know, whether it's eco villages, like people are building uh, out in Wales at the moment for migrants, um, or whether it be a, a kind of Trump style wall. <laughs> so, yeah, so we don't have a huge amount of time left. So I'm curious. So one of the things that we definitely want to talk about, um, is, so you have this week of rebellion coming up. So tell us about that. Tell us about what's. Um, not necessarily maybe what's, what's not what's planned, but like, what's the thinking behind it and what's, how's it feeling? How's the organizing feeling? And I'm curious. Yeah. The energy is, is huge at the moment. We've got, um, yeah, this kind of philanthropist type land guy that gave us this big office in London to be using for organizing. And yeah, there's just, yeah, so many people there at the moment doing every little micro detail of, of the rebellion, whether it's, you know, who's doing the facilities, you know, who's providing the loos for disabled people, or who's looking at, you know, what sashes the people who are going de-escalation are going to wear. There's this amazing energy that, you know, everything you can think of is being covered in some part, and that's really powerful. Um, the idea around um, the international rebellion um, is that, you know, you need to take it to the capital cities to cause um, system change. You need to take it to where the politicians, where the, where the media are, and you need to disrupt because it's, you know, it's moving away from these, this kind of classic uh, environmentalism, which is all about the material actions. It's all about blocking fracking sites, whatever, and moving into the symbolic. So it's about the hearts and minds of ordinary people. And where are they based? They're in London, right? Or a lot of them are anyway. And that, you know, disrupting them is going to have this, it's going to have a big effect on lots of people that live in the city. And, you know, it kind of goes through this phase of, you know, you get quite pissed off with someone because, you know, you get blocked in the road or whatever. And you're like, it's like when you're like a kid or whatever. And, and you know, you, you get told off by your parents or you have an argument with them. And then you go back up into your room afterwards and you kind of sit with it and you go, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have been so mad about that. Maybe they were right or whatever. <laughs> and it's that kind of logic of like, you know, disrupting thousands of people is going to mean that lots of people are pissed off, right? It means that lots of people are going to have a big effect, but lots of them will also be thinking about what's happening and the climate, et cetera. So that's a big part of it is disruption. So we're going to be blocking um, four sites across London and each of them is going to be themed differently. So three of them are going to be themed on the demands. So one is, um, you know, looking at, um, telling the truth so getting you know how do media institutions etc tell the truth it's going to have uh, workshops on that the second is about going zero by 2025 so a kind of solutions type zone and the third is um, the citizens assembly so you know mass people's assemblies uh, and um, you know workshops on citizens assemblies happening there and that's in Parliament Square as well. So it's going to be quite a nice sort of dual power type image going on there, you know, sitting next to Parliament, having a massive people's assembly about how we, how we move forward. And the, and the fourth one is like basically for the pop stars, if they want to come and do a gig, whatever, which should be quite exciting. So yeah, and that, and that energy is going to continue day after day. So it's not actually a week of rebellion. It's for as long as it takes because economic disruption doesn't you know this whole thing with the march right is like oh they've caused a big disruption for one day and then they all go home again afterwards but the economic disruption is like you know the first day you know people get a bit pissed off the second day you know maybe they start losing some sales but the third day you know they're losing business contracts and stuff because they can't get across the city to go give them the food or whatever and supermarkets start running out of food and you know the city faces a, a, a crisis where it's either going to have to start arresting thousands of people for sitting on the streets or it just you know loses its legitimate you know loses face and allows it to continue and that's that huge dilemma action where we know basically that it's a win-win scenario when we go in there because you know if they do start arresting thousands of people 
like you know what we saw from the occupy stuff is that many more are going to get involved because they're going to see people like i said earlier you know that person's kind of like me and they care about something i care about and they're getting arrested i should go off and do something about it I think there was a great graph in your book, Micah, that sort of showed, you know, after those two women were pepper sprayed, the movement grew massively. And then again, when people were arrested, it had this huge uh, incline. And that's what we've seen previously. And that's, you know, the dilemma the government are going to have uh, in a couple of weeks time. So I guess another point just to say on that is maybe a bit more nerdy point, which is about like this sort of festival type atmosphere, which is the kind of what you might call the prefigurative stuff where it's like you're creating the solutions and everything you're kind of creating the things people want to start seeing in the world and then there's the second element to it though which is the strategic which is like blocking off the financial districts and blocking off all these roads and stuff and then combining those two with a few things that can help it to go non-linear um, in, in terms of mobilization so like you know getting pink floyd involved or whatever can then you know hopefully take this to the government coming to the table and uh, yeah we'll see how that goes <laughs> Wow, it's beautiful. It's inspiring. I guess um, we only have a couple of minutes, but if if you were to kind of let's say let's say we can use the power of uh, manifestation. <laughs> so if you were to um, kind of describe the ideal scenario, the ideal scenario that would happen um, that brings the movement into success, like what would it look like? What what would what would what would be the story that you could kind of give us a hint of it? What would be the story that we would be that we'd wake up to? Mm. Yeah, well, um, I think that a big part of it in these first few days is really getting people settled into the streets, into settled into reclaiming the streets. You know, people from all across the UK have travelled down into London to reclaim the streets, to reclaim this heart of power. And they've set up camp there and they're holding these big assemblies where you've got ordinary people stepping up for the first time. They've never been involved with politics, never been involved in anything like this before, but stepping up and saying what they think about the crisis and what's happening and also about being in that atmosphere and how empowering that's going to be for so many people getting involved you know this new energy coming into it and you know people wake up in the morning and they see the whole city shut down and what are they doing instead they're planting trees all over the city you know we've got this idea of having the whole bridges covered um, with pots and plants and all this kind of thing and just changing the whole dynamic and i love when we've done roadblocks in the past because you, you suddenly shut down this massively noisy and chaotic bit of the city and then suddenly it becomes this beautiful, peaceful area where everyone's sitting around, you know, chatting to each other or doing circus tricks or whatever it is. You know what I mean? It's just like totally changing the dynamic of it. And so, you know, you know, holding that energy, holding that love that everyone brings to the rebellion and being able to see that, you know, it's a palpable thing in the streets. And then, you know, getting what victory we can, you know, claiming uh, the victory in whatever way it can, you know, hopefully it is the demands being met or it's getting that, getting those, um, you know, we're thinking about having young people go to meet the uh, the prime minister, having the kind of youth representatives to do the negotiating. Cause I don't know if you've seen Greta um, Thunberg or whatever, but she's just like, you know, I want her in the room. <laughs> um, and you know them negotiating the deal and then saying you know well we've won basically we've kind of we've called this massive rebellion we've got thousands of people onto the streets and we're getting our demands met and you'll see us again in november when we do it again you know what i mean and it's just like you know we're not stopping anytime soon that's beautiful all right on that note thank you so much robin for um yeah, i appreciate it thank you so sharing much for everything yeah that's great and um yeah, best of luck. We'll, we'll do our best to, to spread the word too. So thank you. Yeah, great. There's going to be um, rebellions in New York and, and Los Angeles, I, I'm aware of, and I think other places in, in the States. It's going to be in over 30 countries, um, you know, groups set up all over the world, um, probably doing civil disobedience for the first time, a lot of them. And uh, yeah, that's a really exciting thing, I think, is building this, this culture of civil disobedience, you know, reintroducing it into this, yeah. Uh, uh, neoliberal society that's just falling asleep on the crisis you know what i mean and just like phew, just new energy coming in i'm looking forward to it yeah that's awesome and thank you for being a part of actors graduate school and thank you for everyone for um for taking part in this and awesome thank you so much yeah take it easy see ya